Thank you very much for the invitation to present. Um, so today I just want to talk to a little bit about some of the, the work Johnson Matthews is doing in the area of moths. So I'll, oh, it comes through. So I'll start by just explaining who Johnson Matthews are, what we do, the type of customers that we work with. And then I'll look in some of the, I'll talk about some of the priorities we have in, into moth research, specifically looking at some of the scale up work we've been doing and also some of the in situ monitoring work we've been doing to understand how um, our moths are reacting in the, in the reaction. So first, let me just talk about Johnson Matthew. So Johnson Matthew is a, a specialty chemicals company, uh, really focusing on sustainable technologies. Currently, our biggest businesses are clean air business, which is focusing on um, catalytic converters in automotive vehicles, reducing the toxic emissions uh, from those vehicles. But we're investing heavily in other areas such as batteries, uh, blue and green hydrogen, and also fuel cells, among other technologies as well. So Johnson Matthew has a very long 200 year history, dating back all the way to 1817, where we first started as uh, PGM assays uh, in London. And we've retained that uh, knowledge throughout our history and PGM chemistry is still a, a large part of our, our business today. We're also a very heavily R&D focused uh, company with about 12% of our employees working in R&D. And to supplement that, we also fund over 100 PhDs uh, throughout the world looking at many different technologies um, uh, relevant to Johnson Matthew. So our customers are, are very varied. So we have customers in the... Uh, from automotive to chemicals um, and all the way to pharmaceutical and medical customers as well. But what links all of our customers together is the requirement for world leading scientific solutions to the problems that they have in their industries. And the way Johnson Matthew does helps these customers is by using, you know, utilizing our nine core competencies. These range from uh, analysis to chemical synthesis um, and also formulation, PGM, metallurgy, a wide variety and we use all of our competencies to deliver insight into the fundamental material characteristics that our our, um, our customers use and with that we can develop a, a commercialized scalable solution to their problems we also use this a lot we also use our competencies a lot in our in our moth work as well so we have six um, current priorities uh, in the moth work in a jam three application-based uh, priorities. So these are separations and purifications, uh, things like CO2 capture is, is one we're looking at, but also other processed gases and other uh, harmful and toxic gases. In addition to that, we're also looking at fine chemical catalysis using MOFs and also controlled release of, um, you know, of uh, materials from MOFs as well. Now underpinning our application-based work is the work that we, we're looking at in, in terms of scaling up these MOFs to make a, a, a commercial solution. In addition, we're also looking at modeling to try and to understand which MOFs to choose for the right application. And also, what I'll talk about again, is the in-situ monitoring work we'll be doing to understand um, our MOFs and what, what we're doing. So first, let me talk about some of the, the scale-up work we've been doing. Um, so a number of different considerations that we need to, to take when we're scaling up a MOF. Um, typically, our MOFs are, are scaled using um, solvent systems and if we and we can uh, categorize the consideration in two so we can look at chemical considerations and also physical considerations when we when we skin up moths so typically uh, in literature you'll see moths produced um, in solver thermal solvo thermal methods using uh, very nasty toxic solvents which is really not applicable to a scalable solution so what initially what we we're trying to do is trying to uh, replace those toxic solvents with um, less toxic solvents. And here's just a, a schematic, um, a ranking system from a, a green chemistry paper, which we use sometimes to, to choose some of our uh, um, solvent choices for, for some of the considerations. And it ranks the solvents based on safety, health, and environmental uh, score. In addition to the chemical, we also have to look at the physical, think about the physical aspects. Um, so these, so, these are things like um, how concentrated our solutions are. So in literature, it's often used uh, a very dilute solution to produce these MOFs. And this produces a lot of waste. Um, in order to reduce and produce a scalable solution, 
we need to try and increase those concentrations, reduce that waste, and produce a, a better material, a more uh, sustainable and um, economic material. In addition to, to the uh, concentration, we also need to think about uh, mixing quite heavily. Um, in a lab-based system, mixing is often overlooked. Um, however, when we move to these larger systems that we're looking at, we need to think about mixing a, a lot more, um, especially as we, when we consider moss, uh, the viscosity of the material, uh, viscosity of the liquid increases over time and that can be problematic for mixing. And then this could impact the poly performance at the end of the, uh, the reaction. So I'll just give you uh, a quick overview of uh, one of the MOFs that we looked at scaling up. Uh, this has been reported in, a, in another green chemistry paper. So this was looking at uh, ZIF-94. ZIF-94 is a very similar MOF to, to ZIF-8 and it's uh, isoreticular to ZIF-8, so it's a very similar structure. It's slightly different in the fact that it's the linker is, has different chemical functionalities to ZIF-8. But the ZIF-94 is also used for similar applications. And one of the applications it's used for is uh, CO2, CO2 separations in, in mixed matrix membranes. Now, classical production in uh, literature uses, uh, requires use of DMF, which is a very toxic solvent and not very nice to use at a large scale. It also uses subthermal conditions, which again, are difficult to scale up, um, especially uh, considering the cost um, required for the, uh, a MOF of this type. So we, we have reported the production of this MOF uh, at room temperature uh, using a, a methanol and THF um, solution. So we report this at quite low, we sense at low concentrations, but we want to try and improve on this, um, this synthesis and increase that concentration. So we set out by looking at a systematic way to try and improve the synthesis. So we did a, a number of different small scale experiments. So these are, these are all five gram scale experiments. When we look at um, producing this material uh, at low uh, wave percents, we see at low reaction times, we start to see the presence of, a, of an impurity. Now this impurity has been identified as ZIF-93. But if we, but if we um, continue with the synthesis, if we continue and leave the reaction to, to continue, uh, this impurity disappears and eventually we produce a phase pure material. Now, if we increase the concentration of this reaction further, again, we see this impurity appearing at the lower reaction times, but it's retained um, further on in the reaction to up to three hours. And we have to leave it to 16 hours for it to, to produce a phase pure material. Now, this isn't too problematic for us, um, 16 hours versus th uh, three hours is, is really not too much of an issue. So what we wanted to see if, if we could uh, increase this concentration even more just by leaving it longer. And in fact, we managed to increase the concentration all the way up to 18 weight percent um, and still produce a phase pure material. So like I said, these were only small five gram batches when we wanted to try and look at a larger batch. So we produce this material at a 60 gram batch scale. And again, we can see we, we produce a phase pure material with the right uh, characteristics, uh, nanoparticle characteristics. And in fact, this material actually, um, we saw an increase in the CO2 capacity for this material versus the uh, DMF method uh, reported in literature. So it's a really positive uh, impact for us. So just a, a quick summary of that, that work. So we managed to imp uh, improve the method for ZIF-94. We've, we've gone from a solar thermal method using a very toxic solvents to a room temperature uh, and pressure uh, reaction using um, methanol and THF, which is, is better than DMF. We've also produced this, uh, uh, replicated this uh, synthesis at uh, one kilogram scale. And we don't see any reason why we can't, why this reaction can't scale further. We do appreciate that there are some, a number of room for improvement that we could do, and we could use statistical methods such as design of experiments to improve uh, the reaction and optimize the reaction um, further. Now we've used this systematic method uh, for a number of other uh, scale-up uh, procedures as well. So we, we've worked in a number of different projects as well. Um, so we've also scaled up uh, 15 uh, kilograms of IMBTC for uh, another project using a, a 60 litre vessel. We're lucky enough in, in GMT, uh, GM, Johnson Matthew to have um, many different access to many different equipment, large scale equipments that we can, we can use and, and try. 
and we, we were able to produce a phase pure material with the right specific characteristics as well. And in addition to that, we also managed to produce a 10 kilogram batch of nickel CPO, which was used in a, a demonstrator unit in Egypt for heat pumps and uh, desalination uh, technology. So that was just a brief overview of some of the scale up work that we've been doing. I'll now uh, talk about some of the uh, in situ monitoring. So this is looking at um, trying to improve our reactions by monitoring the react what's happening while the reaction is happening. So for this work, we used a, a case study of ZIF-8. Uh, ZIF-8 is quite important to us. Uh, it's used in many different multiple projects um, and um, a lot of our customers uh, are quite interested in ZIF-8. Our current preparation method for this route uses methanol at very low concentrations uh, and it's really not scalable. We have seen that we can produce ZIF-8 in water. However, we have seen in certain circumstances that we sometimes produce a uh, a different material, uh, very similar. So it's a dense polymorph of ZIF-8, which is ZIF-L. It's a very similar material. It's just, um, it's not porous or very less porous. It's kind of a, a squash version of ZIF-8 um, as represented by this uh, paper on the side here. So when we're producing this, we're wasting a lot of time um, waiting for the reaction to finish and later um, uh, filtering uh, and analyzing reaction, analyzing the, the material that we get at the end. So we wanted to see if we can try and track this reaction in situ and understand when we're producing ZIF-8 and when we're producing ZIF-8. Um, and this would also save us a lot of time in, in um, developing the synthesis later on. And also it's a, it's a good opportunity for us to, to, to use this at scale as well. So one of the in-situ monitoring apparatus we used was uh, based on the Arduino platform. So this is a, a kind of a microcomputer. Uh, and it's a very nice platform to use because it's a very flexible and very cheap platform. So in our case, we've used a, a temperature probe, a pH meter. We've also used a turbidity meter. So a turbidity meter measures the, uh, how turbid the water is. So it's a relation to how much solid uh, is, is in, the, uh, in the solution that you're measuring. But it's a very flexible platform. Um, and with just an afternoon worth of coding, we can, we can develop this data logger with all three, um, all three of the, the information that we need. And in the future, we could also add different uh, sensors um, should we find something that would be applicable to one of the applications that we're looking at. So this is just a representation of, of what we've done, so of how we've uh, done our reaction. So we've, we've managed to, one of uh, our colleagues managed to make um, a holder to hold all these different sensors, um, the turbidity, pH, and temperature probe in the reaction. Uh, and it's all linked to an Arduino and then towards the laptop. And here's the, uh, what it looks like in, a, in our fume hoods. So this is the type of data we get from our, um, from our equipment. So we have pH, temperature, and turbidity. So if we look at pH, um, we can see um, there's a rapid decrease in pH before it levels off. And this is uh, due to the consumption of linker, the basic linker in the solution. And also the production of um, nitric acid from our, our metal source. And this is likely also um, the cause of the temperature increase. But the most interesting uh, thing for us is the turbidity measurements. So what we see with the turbidity, we can that the turbidity increases very rapidly before it plateaus out. Now, what we can assume from this plateau is that no more solid is being produced after once the turbidity is plateaued. And we can actually reduce the reaction time of our materials, of our synthesis um, significantly um, by, monitoring, by monitoring in this way. One of the things we've been able to do uh, using these measurements is to estimate the amount of uh, I'm estimating our, the yield of a uh, product that we're producing. Now this is a really valuable tool for us because we can use it as a, a quality control check. And it's also quite powerful at a larger scale to under, understand if our reaction is successful or not and whether um, we just stop the reaction and start again or, or we uh, carry on. And it significantly reduces the amount of time we've uh, spent on failed reactions. One of the most valuable tools that we've managed to, to use for this turbidity measurement is phase identification. So here's this two, we see two turbidity curves. Uh, the blue one is a typical curve of ZIF-8 and the red one is a typical curve of ZIF-L. 
So the ZFA curve is a very simple curve. It, the turbidity increases before it plateaus, like we've seen before. But with the ZFL curve, we see a feature uh, appear around 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, before a rapid increase in turbidity. And again, the um, turbidity levels off. This feature we assume is the, the formation of a metastable phase. So this is a really valuable tool for us because we can now see when we're producing um, ZIF, -A, ZIF A and ZIF L in our reactions and we don't have to wait until uh, product workup to understand um, the material that we've produced. So it's a really good a quick method. So we've reduced our phase identification time from a matter of days before we get in the XRD to, to a matter of minutes and, and understanding what's going on in the reaction. So to summarize this uh, in situ work, so we wanted to produce a, a way to track our reactions in situ. Um, we were able to use this to understand um, the yield that we're producing, and also the phase that we're producing in the system. It's also a good route to understand what's going on in the reaction and whether we can try to improve our synthesis later on. And, and in, in some cases, we may even be able to um, develop some IP in this area. So this was used as a case study for the work at, for work at GM for MOF materials. But there are no reasons why this can't be done for other materials, uh, other precipitation type reactions. Uh, and we're looking at that as well. So with that, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, all my colleagues uh, in various different locations um, for some of the work we've done. Um, and thank you very much.